Super, thank you. Um, yeah, and it's not my fault we're running late, so I'm not going to go fast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I should also mention, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm here on, for two companies. I'm also the CEO of Neo Neuro, a company that we set up in Paris back in 2015. And the work that I'm going to be talking about today comes from both companies. And both people. So no, I didn't come from Canada. I just stopped working in Paris. But the hour, the hour of it, that is. So I'm going to go through um, what we're doing. We're, this is kind of something completely different. Uh, we don't do CBEX anymore. Uh, we talked a bit about this last year. I'll talk about it again just to go through it. Um, we call it Neomer. Um, but it's 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 not a CBEX. Um, and then I'm really going to talk about meta-analysis and structures. I think everything you're doing is great. I love all the crystal structures. We learn a ton. I don't have patience for doing that called the afterwork. So really, I'm interested in meta-analysis and what can we learn about thousands of things at once. So just to review a little bit, the neoverse selection method. What we do is, is one of the issues with CFX is your random region is so large. You have so many possible sequences. When you're starting with a quadrillion, you're starting with one copy of each. You have to be iterative to get enrichment. And that means every time you're hitting a new target, you're using a new initial library. You can't use the same initial library on different targets. So, and I guess the other side of it that I'll say here is, is that all these talks are great. As a company, what we're really engaged with is getting outwards to work in matrix. Um, and that's, that's the biggest issue. That's the biggest constraint that we have in the outdoor world is getting outdoors to work in matrix. And one of the biggest differences between after development and antibody development is immune tolerance. With antibodies, anything that binds to cell is eliminated. With aptamers, we don't have that. And if you think of something like, like HSA in serum, on average, that's there at 600 micromolar. That's huge. If your target is there at six nanomolar, that's 100,000 or 100,000 level of specificity you need to keep your outcome uh, saturated out. If you're doing binding assays, you can't detect something that binds your outcome. Uh, so you don't know on an SPRI or an SPR or ITC, it looks great because you can't detect something that binds 100, 1,000 or 10,000 fold less than what, what you're binding. So we need even less than that. The other one that's really cool is, is when you think about that, the immune tolerance, it's not just against other proteins, it's against epitopes. So any epitope that is self, it, it doesn't recognize by the antibody. So that gives us a huge advantage what we're doing with afterwards in terms of our ability to see all the epitopes all the time, which that, that's a huge plus of what we're doing with that. So, sorry, Neomer Library, 16 random nucleotides that we interspersed in. That gives 4.29 billion possible sequences. This is a number that we can work with. Remember in CFX as well, in the first round, you're losing 99.99% of your sequences arbitrarily anyway. They're gone. Um, so we're almost starting with the same number. You probably are reasonably in CFX anyway. We start with an average of 1,000 copies of each of those. We do an NGS trick, which I'll show you in the next slide, that we can then characterize the frequency of each of those 4.29 billion sequences. Uh, so that we can do it in one round and we can see how it's modulating from that, that average of a thousand. So that's, that's why it's, it's, we're not enriching. So how do we do that? I'm a geneticist. Um, so we use the planet square. Um, we use the library that I showed at the top. I should have mentioned here too, because we're going to talk about structure here a bit. Um, that library is designed such that all the fixed sequences do not cause any secondary structure. That was tough designing that. Uh, so any secondary structure is driven by the 16 random nucleotides. We do the selection with that, we amp it once, then we cut it in the middle, and we, we prepare the two modules for NGS prep separately. That in an NGS run is, we get about 5 million per library reads, um, the way we set it up. So that's giving us good coverage of those 65,000 possible sequences in each module. We take those frequencies, put those in a Punnett square, multiply them all out, and that matrix says the frequencies for all 4.29 billion. 
in the first place for each selection. Um, now we have to build Linux servers. This, this is getting beyond Excel at this point. <laughs> uh, so what this enables us to do then is we do each selection in triplicate. And so we do the same target three times without target three times. That's the simplest. I mean, a lot of it is counter targets and stuff. But then we can look at, we compute across that the average frequency of each of those 4.29 billion sequences and the standard deviation. So I think we are, you know, all humble and, and politeness, we're making after discovery more of a science. It's reproducible, uh, which is kind of a definition of science, right? We can do the same selection over and over, and we can do um, average means and, and standard deviations on each sequence and pick that up out of that. The other, and then we do Z9. You can see I'm Canadian. It's a Z9. That'll be okay here. Um, that we just take that average divided by the standard deviation for each them. And we output the top 10,000 sequences for each selection in terms of Z values. The other one, and, and kind of coming back to this, is we're building a knowledge base. Every time we do a new selection, it's the same sequences. So we can look at the same fingerprint on that and we continue to build a knowledge base as we go with this. We're using this at our, our, our lab in Paris, Neo Neuro, where we call it aftermarkers. And this is an agnostic discovery. We use the same library, the 4.29 billion, and we just put them on different blood samples. So blood samples of people with the disease, blood samples of people without the disease. And we're screening for 4.29 billion epitopes in the blood with each, with each one. We then do that analysis of the contrast between the individuals that we NGS, well, NGS, that the individuals with the disease versus those without, and we identify the afterwards that are the most meaningful diagnostic with that one. It's really exciting. <laughs> um, we focused on Alzheimer's disease. So we've developed a blood test for brain amyloid based on PET scans. Um, on plasma, we're testing this. We developed this with eight, what we call them aptomarkers. Now, I like to make stuff. Um, and we don't know what they bind to, but we put that, those, and we just do a qPCR at this point. We put them onto, onto the blood, the amount of bound, we separate off, and we do a qPCR on those. And that's what's great in medical labs now, post pandemic, everybody's got qPCR machines. And everybody knows how to use them really well. Uh, so, um, yeah, and then we'll put that into a machine learning model with clinical variables as well and develop a, a predictive um, test out of that. Now, this may not look great in terms of predictivity, but actually it's pretty competitive. I won't do my commercial spin and talk on that um, because we're not using genetics on this. The APOE allele is really important. We can really increase our predictivity. But for ethical reasons, they're not using that at almost all clinics in Europe. Um, reason being, if you show it on the parent, <coughs> you're declaring a risk factor to all the children. Uh, so you've got to have the whole family sign off on ethics as well. So we had to do this without any genetic support, too. Um, so I should just say before I leave that, that's in preclinical trial, just because we're all interested in commercializations of afterwards. We're in a preclinical trial with Roche Diagnostics financing. Uh, in Portugal right now with that. And we hope to go into CE Mark and FDA approval later this year with, with that test. So that's that's really cool. So how do we characterize uh, like we we I was saying it's agnostic, we go in, but we can also we can also characterize what these afterwards are binding to by taking known targets and then assessing them against the same afterwards that we're doing in the blood samples. So we can back it out that way. And this is something we're setting up a big horizon grant in Europe to do. It's kind of basic, it's reverse genetics, is, is the way to think about it, is, is doing it on a bunch of blood samples with the, with the phenotype, but then also putting in genomics and metabolomics and, and uh, proteomics, and then deconvoluting it all back out so that we can, we can uh, have that kind of knowledge base coming out of it. So well, the movie that, that won the Oscar, Really what we're doing, I think, is we're, we're detecting everything all at once at the same time. <laughs> so now I'll talk about uh, meta-analysis of structures. Um, I know the, my, my bio, our biopetition, he always says like we are adding adaptation to the thing. To me, what we're doing is we're making it a character string. 
It's about making it a character string. If we can make it a character string, then we can do meta analysis. So we take every position in a, in a structure and we give it a label. This was done, BPRNA published this. Uh, so we didn't invent this. Um, so you, this position would be a, a dangling end at the start here, then stem positions, hairpin loop. Just each position has, has a label as to what it is. Then we just make a character string of all those labels. Having that string of positions, we can then do meta analysis on that. We can look at, it's the same thing you do for, for sequence alignments. We run that then in alignments um, and, and start looking at it that way. We have found, and we've done a lot of work with light mutation modes and things like that, structure in terms of afterwards is more important than sequence. Like it's not sequence independent and sequence is driven, it's structure driven by sequence, but a lot of the same structures with different sequences will give it the same point. So structure is, is, is the more important than sequence. Um, so I really want to look at structures on a meta level. Also remember that, that we're getting out 10,000 sequences. I'm not going to do binding on season 10,000. So I've got to figure out how to rationalize that in terms of what we're, we're testing. So the first thing we do is, is we can do with that is, is cluster analysis. Just how are these different um, structure uh, descriptions separate from each other and similar to each other? And that gives us clusters, groups of, of, of sequences, um, which you can kind of think of, if it's all true, you can think of it, these are different solutions that the selection process has shown the afterwards capable of providing to that target. Um, these may be different epitopes on the protein that the afterwards is binding to, but these are, and then what we want to do is we want to pick different sequences from each of these clusters and use those for binding assays as candidates. So we've rationalized the, the exercise somewhat. We also use that for mapping proteins. And we're doing some of that for target engagement where we're mapping where a target, where a drug hits a protein. So we can map all the epitopes on a protein and then see which ones disappear when you add a drug to it. Uh, quick here, an example where we've done this is, we've done this a ton on a ton of projects for clients which I can't talk about. Um, but if you want to see what we're doing, I think the best way to do is not look at the literature, but read the patents. Uh, just search for, for our name on patents. You're going to see a lot more there than you will in published literature. So this was an HSA selection we did in-house. We're always doing HSA because we want to eliminate it. We want to, we want to identify all the sequences that show any response to it and, and then pick your target sequences that don't show any response to HSA. Uh, so this is the top 10,000, so just said score versus full value. We did a meta-analysis of the structures um, to identify clusters and similarities. You can see these, these, it's called an elbow method, where you're supposed to see the elbow in, in the curves. It's, it's always really hard. The, the arm is more like this, where the elbow is, is dodgy. Um, but this one, we said four important clusters. There's obviously a lot more than that. There's a lot of subclusters and things within that. But when you look at those structures, you do see similarities within a cluster. So then we take candidate sequences from that are based on orthogonal to a centroid within each cluster. Um, this is just some of the examples of some of the different things we do. We run that cluster analysis with five different prediction methods for structure. Um, so that we're running it, we're kind of doing some robustness in there. And we're looking at energy calculations on a nucleotide position as well. Uh, so just looking at at um, mean free energy across clusters, you can see this one had a, a higher correlation to it uh, than the other clusters. Uh, centroid distance, which is kind of just an idea of how compact the atomer is versus how, how spread out in space it is. This is really cool. I mean, you've seen Stramu for consensus for sequence motifs and, and pulling that out. This is classic. This is old, 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 old. And we do that, and we're still interested in the sequence ones as well, so pulling those out and looking at that. And a large part of that is twofold. One is for improving the afterwards that we've identified as we truncate and optimize them. The other is to, uh, to increase the robustness of client patent claims um, so that we're, we're, we're not claiming just one big sequence that's easy to work around. We can also do the whole scrum analysis with structure. Um, so we do that and we pick up consensus structures within that. And then we can look at those consensus structures 
um, across the, and so I've been using that for authorization as well. It's, it's really interesting. I found with a bunch of apps where you have a stem, and you have these dangling ends on the end, you take the dangling ends off, they stop working. The dangling mm -hmm. ends need to be there. Uh, uh, I've got to come up with a better word than dangling ends. <laughs> so this is just a choice candidate sequences that we, we out of that. Uh, these are the Z values on the HSA, the Z values for those sequences on by, by pool of IgG, and what cluster they came from from our analysis. Bioinformatics sort of scared of zeros, so we start with cluster zero uh, as our number in there. And to avoid confusion, I'm just keeping it. So these are the binding assays on that. This is we have a Hariba open by SPRI. So these are just the binding curves on that. You can see nice KDs um, on these. Um, I would actually pick these two, even though they rank in terms of the Z value, in terms of the number on there. But I would pick those two because they had really low Z values on IgG. None of them show binding to IgG at all. But I think we can go beyond that with what we're picking up on the MGS data, showing that we're getting no response to IgG as well. Because you could have some binding to IgG and we're not going to see it. So we're going to a level of specificity, A, that is beyond what we've done before, and B, I think we need to in order to be commercial. So conclusions. Um, I think the Neomer approach, the reason I, I obsessed on it and drove it, we're going to do this against almost everybody in the lab saying, no, 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 let's do C, let's just sit down, um, is, is because I think we need to, we need to move to higher levels of specificity. Um, and be, levels of specificity beyond what we can measure right now. Um, and this whole idea of how we can build knowledge bases out of it. Um, I already said this function of not only evaporates is a part of their, their structures. You'll see some patents coming out shortly where we're looking at, at uh, patent claims for clients uh, where we're actually claiming structure as part of patent claims. Um, these are the, the people that actually do the work. The two people from the top is the Paris team. It's pretty small. We have a, a growing team in Canada as well. Um, and I, I guess I should just at this point as well is both companies are growing, both, both are going really well. So anybody that's looking at employment as well, send, send, us, send us your resume. Uh, we're always looking. Uh, in Canada, we, we need to hire Canadians first. And in Europe, it has to be EU. So sorry, Brexit. Um, <laughs> so thank you. Oh, also I'll just mentioned we will be publishing all these results. That's why I didn't show sequences yet. Because we're going to publish uh, the aftermarker and uh, that HSA and IgG's results that's in preparation for publication now. Uh, so that will be going out soon. Thanks.